Well, welcome to our study of Galatians. We're going to start in Galatians 1.1. And as we do that, what I hope you will do is follow along with your study questions. We've got a booklet of study questions and you can follow along with that. So let me give you a little bit of background before we begin on um, on our verses. So Galatians is considered to possibly be the first letter that Paul wrote. It's probably written to uh, the Galatians as a uh, ethnic group, a group of churches, and in that vein, Paul is writing to a large swath of people. He's writing to believers. We know that because of the context of the book. He says it many times. He's writing to believers in churches, and these are churches that he has been at, churches that likely he even began. It is not long since he was actually there with these believers. So many of them he knows personally. And in this letter, we see him speak very very, very directly, very personally to these believers. One of the big challenges that he's dealing with, the big challenge he's dealing with, I guess I should say, is the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a group of people who admitted that the Messiah had come in the person of Jesus Christ, but they said that in addition to faith in Christ, you also have to uh, follow the Jewish law. Now you can see why that would create problems, especially for churches where there are many Gentiles. And so there was this pressure from the Judaizers to, um, to convert those believers in Jesus to what we would call a legalistic system, a uh, following of the Jewish law in addition to faith. I think that's enough for us to get started, so let's begin to read. Paul says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, uh, I'm sorry, let me do that again. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. What we see first is in the very first line, Paul is laying out his purpose here. One of his purposes is to defend his gospel. And to defend his gospel, he had to defend his own authority to teach that gospel. So you've got Paul and you've got the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were probably accusing Paul of not really being an apostle. So Paul comes straight out and makes battle against that accusation. He says, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Verse 2, and all the brethren who are with me. So Paul has sort of an entourage that he travels with, and so he is greeting them uh, on, a, on behalf of everyone who's with him. He says, to the churches of Galatia. Now this is important because it lets us know that he's writing to believers. He's writing to the churches. He doesn't say to the unbelievers in Galatia. He says to the churches. And at this time, the church was made up of believers. So the church is not a building. It's not a physical location. It is the people of God. So all believers make up the true church. So when he says he's writing to the churches, that means he's writing to believers. Verse 3 Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father. So what's interesting to me about this is that many times when we read this line, it's easy to think that he's talking about deliverance from hell. And it's very possible that this encapsulates that. But I want you to think about what he says here. In verse 4, he says, he's talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. We, we know that Jesus took away the sins of the world because John the Baptist uh, said it. Think about John 1, I believe it's verse 29, where he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the entirety of the world's sin has been dealt with. It's been taken away. And now... Uh, and so that's a that's a done deal. And so he's talking to believers, telling them about that uh, that state of affairs. But notice what he goes on to say. He who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. Okay, so here's what's interesting. He gave himself for our sins, uh, and in a in like a judicial sense, that happened. 
Okay, that already happened. He took care of it. But there is then a result of that that he hopes that will follow, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Now, there's two ways in which the uh, readers of this could be delivered from this present evil age. The first is just that when they die, they go to heaven, or uh, that Jesus would return and rapture the church and we would be delivered from this present age. But think about the believers who live in a time when Jesus um, did not return. How is it that Jesus uh, delivered them from their present evil age? Well, that's what he's going to lay out in the rest of this book. He's going to defend the faith alone gospel. And part of the faith alone gospel is that it allows people to be delivered from the flesh. And in the, in the book of Galatians, what we're going to find is that when he uses the word flesh, he doesn't always mean uh, just lascivious, open sin. What he means uh, a number of times in Galatians is that attempt in our flesh to follow the law, to follow the Old Testament law. And so the gospel delivers us from this present age where the law used to be in, in a, a, a very strong need. Uh, I said that weird. The, the present age needed the law as a tutor, as a guide to sort of build boundaries around uh, evil and the damage that sin causes. But Jesus came to deliver us from all of that, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Let's take a look at verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end of Paul's um, somewhat cordial uh, uh, hello, his greeting. Though even there, it wasn't terribly cordial. Uh, it seems that he's a little bit upset, and we'll notice that in this next verse. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So we think, um, historians I should say, think that Paul had been in Galatia only about six months earlier. So this is fresh. This is new. And so he's talking to many that we might call baby believers, new Christians, people that are uh, just kind of freshly off the boat, so to speak. And so here's what he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon. It hasn't been very long. Paul was there, and it almost seems like these Judaizers, these legalists, sort of follow Paul, followed Paul around trying to convert the churches that he started. And so he is astounded. He marvels how quickly they have turned from what he taught them. Uh, and what he says is, when you turn, you are turning from him who called you uh, in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So uh, I want to kind of illustrate this. So if you came to faith and you understand the faith alone gospel, but then you turn to something else, what Paul's saying here is if you turn away from the faith alone gospel, not only are you turning away from that idea or that understanding or that message, but you're also turning away from Christ who called you. Because he says, which uh, he says, um, you turned away so, uh, so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. In verse 7, he says, which is not another. And this is really important. So what he's saying is, you're turning to a, another gospel. We could almost put that in air quotes, right? It's another gospel. However, this other gospel is not really another gospel. I, I use this illustration sometimes that if you have milk, and orange juice. You have two different things, but when you mix them, they are no longer milk or orange juice. There's some new concoction that is uh, really hard to drink and really gross. And so you can think about it that as the gospel. You've got the gospel and you've got this other thing, and if you try to mix them, what you have then is no longer the gospel. So if you try to add the following of works for justification, the following of the law to be saved, then you no longer have the gospel, and you've turned away not only from Jesus, but from the saving message. Now, we should say at this point, that doesn't mean that someone that does this automatically loses their uh, eternal life. I mean, you can't get unsaved once you're saved, right? But you can get confused. You can get, um, you can get twisted up and get confused about what the message is, even after you've uh, legitimately believed in it. 
Verse 7, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So what he's saying is these Judaizers, although he doesn't use that word here, these Judaizers have come in and they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They want to twist it up. We know that this happens quite often, actually, because Peter says so. Peter, in one of his letters, says about Paul's writings in all Scripture that there are those who twist it. They intentionally twist it up. And so these Judaizers have come in and they trouble them in the sense that they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And you can imagine how much trouble that is creating. But here he says that famous line, verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. I think that's really powerful because we know about a number of religions that have started based on some kind of experience with an angel or some sort of esoteric um, encounter. And so what he's saying here is even if somebody comes and seems to have authority from heaven, but they say something other than what I've told you, then let them be accursed. Now, unfortunately... Some translations use the phrase eternally condemned right there, and I think that's an unfortunate translation. Accursed is really better because it's ambiguous as to the eternal state. Because someone can get confused about the gospel, or they can even go on after they've believed in the gospel, they can go on and intentionally twist up the gospel message for whatever reason. We, we know that can happen. So what he says is if somebody does that, then let him be accursed. And so this curse, this idea of the curse is going to show up in later chapters. So what I want to do is put a pin in that and we're going to come back to it. We're going to see it in later chapters and it has to do with those who try to follow the law. He's going to go on to tell us that those that try to follow the law are under the curse. And I believe that's where he's going with this. Let's look at verse 9 and we'll wrap up with this for our first session. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. What's interesting here is he says it twice. That lets us know that this is important. In the ancient world, ink and paper, probably was parchment or something like that, ink and paper were not cheap. And so to repeat yourself, uh, you have to have a good reason. And here he repeats himself. He is letting them know that this is a big deal, guys. You should not be abandoning what I taught you. And those who are preaching it are under the curse. They're under the curse that comes with trying to be legalistic and follow the law for justification. So at this point, what I want you to do, if you haven't already, is to look at your study questions and think through all of those questions. Those questions are designed to help you think through the scripture. I really want you to interact with the material here and um, consider what we have uh, and, and consider what we learn from these verses. Thanks for watching.